Welcome back to the Revolution in Ideology podcast. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And we are back in our Myth is America series. We haven't left in a while. Our last, uh, I don't know, handful of episodes have all been within the realm of Myth is America. And today we are going to focus on some very brave women who were able to challenge systems of power and oppression during their period of time um, in the 1800s. We're, of course, talking about the Lowell Mill Girls of Massachusetts. Uh, so without further ado, let's build them a real brief context. Um, I'm not going to do a whole lecture on the Industrial Revolution. That would take us all day. Um, and how that affected the United States with transportation and deforestation and all that other junk that deserves its own episode. Right now, we're just going to heavily focus on what the industrial process looked like at the turn of the 19th century. So I'm going to just do a brief like timeline here of like events uh, that will kind of set the context for these Lowell Mill girls that eventually rise up in resistance against their uh, labor exploitation. So let's just kick this off. Anything before we we start moving? Nope. I'm excited. Okay. So in terms of industrialism, we all know, and we all learn this, it's one of the few things we do learn in the K-12 through system, is that rapid urbanization took place. So a lot of people are moving to cities. We know that. If we go through highlights of this process, is this really living? Well, as somebody that is uh, often accused of being like, what do they call me, an anarcho-primitivist sometime, of like mm -hmm. going back to like the, I find it quite of appalling. I don't know that I'm really an anarcho-primitivist. I don't have those skills. I'd probably die, but whatever. Anyway, like this idea of critiquing like, mass like industrial or modern communication or modern technology all those types of things that i like to criticize this is why i get accused of it anyway let's go through a brief synopsis here so what's the process first and foremost the process begins in the united states with conquest of land and resources under manufactured auspices myth is america has already focused on that with what happened to the indigenous peoples the next thing that happens with the industrial age that is often overlooked is wholesale destruction some say reclamation of the environment without any regard for future generations so that is a hallmark of industrialism the second part or the third part that we must talk about that for industrialism to take place place is resource extraction. Then we move on to what we call agriculture on arable land after, of course, everything's been extracted. Um, and to make that work in America, they had to sell the rugged individual self-made dream of which we spent an episode talking about Jeffersonian agrarianism. The next thing we have to talk about is they move to extraction of more raw materials and those raw materials are then sent to the cities where they are refined. They then, once they make them to the cities, ideologically, materially, and practically limit access to creating the self-made dream. What I mean by that is all of these lands that were recently opened up at the expense of indigenous people through land dispossession were not equitably distributed. The wealthy, of course, got them first, made it harder for poor people to access those lands. If you could not access those lands or could not hack it on horrible land, you ended up in the city and you need employment. You need to make money. So again, what we see here is class stratification being built into the system. The next thing we have to talk about is draw labor into those refineries or the factory of those raw materials. Cities boom around them due to all of the above limitations in opportunity. Again, this idea of selling the American dream in the breadbasket of America, especially the Ohio Valley at the time, uh, did not come to fruition for the vast majority of Americans at the time. So you're forced to then sell your labor back in the city. Um, since you are desperate for work and to make a living, they then abuse the labor that is working for them in these factories while selling the possibility that if they just work hard enough, they might make it out of the factory at some point. Moving forward, they then create this product dependency through specialization. So in other words, if you were a farmer that could take care of yourself, dig wells, grow your own food, make your own clothes, if that was your family, but you can't do that on land, you then go into a factory where we already know it's mechanized and you become specialized and you start to lose those other skills. So you can no longer feed yourself. You then become dependent upon whatever, the system to feed you, whether it's going to a store or a market or whatever, you then go to a seamstress rather than making your own clothes. And slowly but surely you see this interconnectivity, not of freedom, but of dependency, and that is a hallmark of industrialism. Regardless, we also see in the factories the dehumanization process of the labor, merely turning them into cogs in a machine, of which later groups will advocate raging against. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. 
<laughs> I was not expecting that. It is what it is. <laughs> they then basically essentially mechanize the worker. You are mechanized. Your time is monitored. When you can go on break, when you can go to lunch, you become a mechanized person. I mean, think about today, like all of the different like taxes on our time. We have watches um, so that we can be at class on time or be at work on time or be at a meeting on time. Like you're, a natural human day is not supposed to be fractured this way by the minute. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts? No, I mean, most people would probably agree. It's absolutely awful. You're then, of course, constantly supervised. And, of course, as a worker, just like a cog, you are interchangeable. You choose to resist. You are replaced by another desperate worker. And that is how they keep them oppressed, fracturing the labor system. Anyway, and sometimes you get voice. And it is voice that is important here. And when we say voice, we're talking about uh, exit voice and loyalty, of which we have an entire like episode on or a short, like actually it's not even an episode. It's just a short educational video uh, that Nick put together on exit voice and loyalty. Anyway, workers often exerted voice against this system and honestly won um, a whole lot of battles for us in the modern world throughout the 19th and early 20th century. One of the best examples of these sets of workers that exerted voice during this time period that gets very little recognition are the Lowell Mill girls of the early 1800s. And that's what we're going to talk about in this episode. So I know you're excited. I'm just going to kick us right off unless you have anything. Are to we add. going to talk about company towns at some point? We are, but that's okay, not good. now. That's not now. No, I just want to make sure stuff, that we're not. Yeah, in Chicago, yep. yeah, yeah. We're definitely going to be doing that, but that's, cool. that's not yet. Yeah. Okay. So, the Lowell Mill Girls. In 1813, Francis Lowell Boston Manufacturing Company um, was a company that basically was meant to produce textiles. This is important because based on the process I all too briefly went about, went about uh, explaining a few minutes ago, what essentially we see here is there is a lot of cotton being produced in the United States, and there needs to be some place to, of course, refine this and then resell it and, of course, create this, this market growth. Market growth is often like, again, it's, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? It is manufactured. So basically, you manufacture need, like clothing and all those other types of things that people used to be able to produce on their own. Yeah, I mean, the market itself doesn't just grow magically because it has some need to grow. Like, you have to invent this growth and yeah, create it somehow. Yeah, I don't want to say, somehow. like, modern marketing, like commercials and stuff like that. That's not a thing back then, but it, it would become a thing where we're manufacturing need um, rather than want. No, that's a good way of putting it. Manufacturing need. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, that's where this, this company really fills in, uh, the gaps between what's being produced with cotton, um, how to of course acquire more land and how we're going to refine these materials and then sell them to the public and then get people to of course have to work so that they can buy these products. It's a vicious cycle. Anyway, that's what Lowell's about in these mills, at least initially. It is more integrated than earlier mills that existed. They are not the first mills in the United States. Um, some say the mills in Rhode Island were actually a little bit more, were uh, predated them um, in terms of what we would think of as a factory or initial factories in the United States. But these low mill girls or these low mills and the women that worked in them would come shortly uh, uh, off the coattails of what happened in Rhode Island. Now, the cotton basically to the finished garment would take place in one factory. That's important because that's what I mean by integrated. Do you understand what I'm saying regarding like this? So everything takes place in this mill from like raw material to like finished good. It doesn't go to like multiple places. Yep, for okay. sure. So Which is common back then. Yeah. Okay. Expansion into Lowell, Massachusetts, the town is named after the company, takes place in 1821. By 1840, the mills employed 8,000 women. Ages 15 to 35, though there were a few accounts of women as young as 10, I guess they're not even women, those are children, that is child labor, children, um, were uh, essentially like there um, working and being exploited for their labor. Now, how did they attract these women? They did not enslave them and like hold them at gunpoint like you're going to work in this mill, but they did attract them by selling, of course, this idea of them improving women's condition, that going into the factory is a way that women will be able to eventually rise up and achieve some sort of equity in society, maybe economically, not politically. They were not selling suffrage yet. They weren't ready for that, but some sort of independence or equity, yeah. and it might be a good Economic way. independence. Yeah, yeah, well, at least while they're young. Mm -hmm. But here's the other caveat to that. It, it wasn't economic independence merely for economic independence sake. It's so that you could prove yourself a worthy woman to eventually attract a man. Yeah. Yes. So this is still the patriarchy running the show here. Okay. Anyway, 
Uh, Lowell, over time, would eventually become known, uh, famously, as the City of Spindles. It becomes a mass production icon in New England. It becomes the model, in my opinion, for profit over people. Between 19, or excuse me, 1846 and 1850, um, it achieved 14% dividends every year. Like, they continue to increase 14%. It was a wildly, wildly profitable place. Okay, so... Now, what was life like for those women? We're going to hear from them in just a second, but just to give you a brief like synopsis, Nick, they had yearly contracts, so you sign a contract for like a year. They're either paid in a daily wage or a per complete product wage. So you're either paid by what you produce per product or on a daily. Regardless, what we see is piecemeal payment. Give me a brief rundown of why Max Weber, of all people, uh, thinks this might be problematic regarding um, the spirit of capitalism. Piecemeal payment. Uh, yeah, so many things. Um, I don't know that you can do it quickly, but yeah. I, I put you on the spot there. But like, this is how you kind of like build this, this idea of, of labor and yeah. control it. Yes, because the let's do it from the, like the exploitation perspective is you only pay someone when they complete whatever it is they're working on. In this case, they're doing textiles, right? So they are motivated to produce as much as absolutely possible. So it creates this sort of self-imposed uh, work ethic, I guess, where you want to work as fast and as quick as absolutely possible because then you generate like more money in theory. But you need the money because the money is now what runs your system because you have to have this money to exchange for food or water or things that you used to be able to just get on your own. Now you're dependent upon the system and that's yep. the vicious cycle. And you have no choice but then to take part in the piecemeal work and then continue. To, yeah, it's just a cycle. Absolutely. Okay. So moving forward, and this is a quote from the Handbook to Lowell, which was published in 1848. There's a little handbook. You had to read this handbook when you go to work. That's not unique to the 1800s. Uh, go work for any major corporation. You have to read all their rules and regulations and go through all their yeah, orientation. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely disgusting. Okay, anyway, this is a quote from the Lowell Handbook. All persons entering into the employment of the company are considered as engaged for 12 months. That's like just blunt. You are engaged. For 12 months in this work like this is an actual contract you selling your labor now it's not nearly as bad as the labor contracts we talked about with indentured servitude uh at this point months ago in that episode but still this is this is selling yourself although it's very interesting we have to point out that i guarantee that it was only unidirectional oh, that absolutely. if like they ended your contract they didn't have to pay you out the oh, remainder of your contract that. yeah yeah absolutely um as far as hours are concerned uh work began at 5 a.m every day except for the Sabbath, and ended at 7 p.m. The average work week for these women was 73 hours a week. The average work week for these women was 73 hours a week. Work rooms where they had to work always had two bosses, and that's what they were called, that oversaw women's productivity. And I must stress, what gender do you think these two yeah, bosses were? clearly men. Yes. So two men were manned to each room to make sure these women were being as productive as possible. Um, these rooms were hot. They were oppressively loud because like the machinery and everything going on in there is absolutely just, it's, it, 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 it's droning, this constant droning in your head from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. It's filled with all kinds of like, uh, 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 particles i almost like carcinogen whatever but, <laughs> but just particles like like i'm know, sure they were carcinogens yeah, yeah you're like literally breathing these in um and but they, they, they the reason they did they kept these rooms the way they did which were horrible for humans is because this hot like sweaty particle laden room was perfect for the product mm -hmm. the finished product so the product was more important than the people so, of course, that's, again, um, oftentimes a, a, a hallmark of the economic system we all live in. All right. Um, they, there was some critique early on with this system. Like, people would go visit and be like, is this, like, the healthiest place for these women to be? And moreover, the women themselves, which we'll get to in some of these sources we're going to talk about, were also often looked down upon for even engaging in factory work and not being back at home. So there was, like, a little bit of critique even during the time of Lowell's existence. So people would show up, and that's when false press became a thing. Like, they would basically, the, the company would bring people in to write only glowing reviews. Charles Dickens even is part of this. Like, mm -hmm. glowing reviews of what's going on in Lowell, Massachusetts to shield itself from critique. Either critique of this isn't where women belong or critique of the conditions are awful. Yeah, fake news. 
Yeah, fake news, all the way back then. Um, here, here, we have a, an example here from a, a worker named Juliana who wrote in Voices of Industry, which is a publication we'll get to in just a second. She wrote, but we who work in the factory know the sober reality to be quite another thing altogether. And she wrote that in response to some of the glowing reviews that Lowell was getting in the press. Now, when you worked there, you didn't just work there, you had to live there. You had to live in these things called boarding houses for the entire term of your contract. Now, these houses usually housed about 26 women per house and six would share one room per house. So not the optimum living conditions, but maybe better for some people. I don't know, I'm trying to put a silver lining here. You had a curfew of 10 p.m. You had to be back inside at 10 p.m. and men were not allowed inside. Um, Which, if you're keeping track, the work day ended at 7 p.m. So you got three hours, basically, where you didn't have to be locked down in some building of, that was owned by the company. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's it. Three hours a day where you're not locked in company like housing or in the, the mill itself. Now, who oversaw these houses? In this case, it was not men that oversaw the boarding houses because that would be inappropriate. It was usually very mean, old, widowed overseers. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like older women would make sure these younger women would remain in check, essentially. Um, now, here's some other key uh, things that we must know. If you worked at Lowell, you had to attend church. Church was mandatory. What's this? I mean, it's just like we've talked about in the past few episodes, this indoctrination of the belief system that serves so many functions from like making, like we talked about, docile bodies and right. acquiescence and acceptance of the ideology of the oppressor and so on. You weren't allowed to drink, clearly. No alcohol was allowed. Um, there was, it was kind of a, like a temperance movement going on as well at the time. Um, there was also strict practical and social punishment to force conformity. So if you acted out in any sort of way, it would be your peers that were trained to, of course, call you out and punish you. And if they did not, of course, you have your overseer at your house or your overseers in the factory itself. So there was like this strict punishment and guidelines that you had to live by. Again, a literal handbook. In fact, from the handbook itself, verbatim. Lowell will not employ anyone who is habitually absent from public worship on the Sabbath or known to be guilty of immorality. Who hmm. defines immorality here? Right, I guess. The company? The yeah. company gets to define immorality? Whew. Cool. Cool. So, as far as, like, what this actually was like, I think it's best if we actually hear from one of the sources themselves. So, what we have right now is an anonymous source... Um, that was written during the time, actually it was written a little bit later, in 1845. It comes out in a publication called The Lowell Offering. It is anonymous, at least as it was published in 1845, and it is called A Week in the Life of the Mill. Much has been said of the factory girl and her employment. By some, she has been represented as dwelling in a sort of brick-and-mortar paradise, having little to occupy thought, save the weaving of romantic fancies while the spindle or the wheel flies obediently beneath her glance. Others have deemed her a mere servile drudge, chained to her labor by almost as strong a power as that which holds a bondman in his fetters. And indeed, some have already given her the title of the White Slave of the North. Her real situation approaches neither one nor the other of these extremes. Her occupation is as laborious as that of almost any female who earns her own living, while it has also its sunny spots and its cheerful intervals, which make her hard labor seem comparatively pleasant and easy. Look at her as she commences her weekly task. The rest of the Sabbath has made her heart and her step light, and she is early at her accustomed place, awaiting the starting of the machinery. Everything having been cleaned and neatly arranged on the Saturday night, she has less to occupy her on Monday than on other days, and you may see her leaning from the window to watch the glittering of the sunrise on the water, or looking away at the distant forests and fields, while memory wanders to her beloved country home, or it may be that she is conversing with a sister laborer near, returning at regular intervals to see that her work is in order. Soon the breakfast bell rings. In a moment, the whirling wheels are stopped, and she hastens to join the throng which is pouring through the open gate. At the table, she mingles with a various group. Each dispatches the meal hurriedly, though not often in silence, and if, as if sometimes the case, the rule of politeness are not punctiliously observed by all. The excuse of some lively country girl would be, they don't give us time for manners. The short half hour is soon over, the bell rings again, and now our factory girl feels that she has commenced her day's work in earnest. The time is often apt to drag heavily till the dinner hour arrives. Perhaps some part of the work becomes deranged and stops. 
The constant friction causes a belt of leather to burst into a flame. A stranger visits the room and scans the features and dress of its inmates inquiringly, and there is little else to break the monotony. The afternoon passes in much the same manner. Now and then she mingles with a knot of busy talkers who have collected to discuss some new occurrences or holds pleasant converse with some intelligent and agreeable friend whose acquaintance she has formed since her factory life commenced. But much of the time she is left to her own thoughts. While at her work, the clattering and rumbling around her prevent any other noise from her attention, and she must think, or her life would be dull indeed. Thus the day passes on, and evening comes, the time which she feels to be exclusively her own. How much is done in the three short hours from seven to ten o'clock? She has a new dress to finish, a call to make on some distant corporation, a meeting to attend, there is a lecture or a concert at some or one of the public halls, and the attendance will be thin if she and her associates are not present. Or, if nothing more imperative demands her time, she takes a stroll through the street or to the river with some of her mates, or sits down at home to peruse a new book. At ten o'clock, all is still for the night. The clang of the early bell awakes her to another day, very nearly the counterpart of the one which preceded it. And so the week rolls on, in the same routine, till Saturday comes. Saturday, the welcome sound. She busies herself to remove every particle of cotton and dust from her frame or looms, cheering herself meanwhile with sweet thoughts of the coming Sabbath. And when, at an early hour than usual, the mill is stopped, it looks almost beautiful in its neatness. So what we see in that source right there is basically a perfect description of, of how some of the social conditioning kind of came through, that there are silver linings that are talked about there, but then merely like the matter-of-fact way that our anonymous source explains her day shows that, yeah, I mean, like, there it's just not a lot of freedom and merely spending all of your time working or living in these conditions to look forward to like this very short amount of time. This very, like the Sabbath, like your whole week is spent looking forward to the Sabbath. I mean, what are your thoughts, Nick? I mean, like, I mean, I don't know how I can describe it in any other way than it's like depressing to hear that. Like, yeah, if your entire life is organized such where you literally only look forward to going to the company organized church services, like, that's depressing. I mean, she went through every day and how yeah. that works. It's, uh, anyway, okay. I mean, again, the source speaks for itself. Moving on, maybe there is a few positives that we can we can throw out there, some silver lining. Um, I, I, you know, in my research for, for both my classroom and for this episode, a lot of the historical annals try and paint this as just merely the factory existing is positive for women, just in just merely being a place where they could leave the home. Fine. Other positive outlets here is many of these women did get the chance in their short three hours a day that they got free to themselves to educate themselves. Lowell had libraries. They brought in public speakers to give educational le lectures. They did have a theater um, and they did have writing uh, courses and we have evidence of this in a publication at the time called the voices of industry which i already talked like briefly about or mentioned briefly i mean i don't know like what are your thoughts like you work here the conditions are what we just heard but but you're getting kind of educated and maybe some opportunity i mean i, I hate to be this guy but compared to i'm sure other factories at the time right like i hate to be that guy but at least if you're a woman working here probably wasn't as bad as it could be working in some other factory somewhere i guess yeah i mean i guess it does it, yeah i don't know and there are i mean there's sources on this from the women themselves that are in a, a publication called the Lowell offering i'm going to talk about here in a little bit that does that do paint some of this as positive so it's not all like uh oppression but when I see that it's all, you know, when you read through sources like that, you wonder what type of socialization has already taken place for that individual. That's really like the ideological and practical socialization that has taken place for that person to be like, oh man, you know, once a week I get to hear a lecture. So it's cool that I'm working 73 hours a week and having to go to church and having these people breathing down my neck every day, judging my morality. Like, ugh. anyway. All right. Um, as far as uh, all of this is concerned, um, did many people even have the energy to to engage in the library or the theater or the writing classes after 70 hour work weeks? Well, we have another uh, uh, quote from the time it comes from the Boston Daily Evening Voice, which was published in 1867. It says, I will remember the chagrin I often felt when attending lectures to find myself unable to keep awake. 
I am sure few possessed a more ardent desire for knowledge than I did, but such was the effect of the long hour system uh, that my chief delight was, after the evening meal, to place my aching feet in, the easy, in an easy position and read a novel. So even though these things are available to them and they exist and the company can take credit for having them, the conditions of work made it almost impossible for some workers to even like engage in these activities. Well, yeah, you're working 14 hours a day. Like You have no mental capacity, especially with this work. This isn't like sitting in an office somewhere. This is hardcore. You're, you don't want to go home and learn. Like You don't have the mental or physical capacity to do that. Obviously, it wasn't perfect enough. And so uh, essentially there were strikes that eventually would break out, not necessarily completely over the conditions, but there, the conditions do play a role. Strikes break out in 1834 and 1836, and this is what we really want to celebrate about these women. Labor organization, which again is usually credited to white men, usually a little bit later in history, uh, closer to the end of the 1800s and the early 20th century. Um, not so. Not in U.S. history. Labor organization actually really, we would argue, began on plantations with slaves. That's where it really started. But then, of course, here, another group of oppressed people, i.e. women, also uh, play a wildly important role in pushing uh, labor reform forward long before white men. So, again, that, that's part of what this Myth, Myth, Myth is America series is about, is calling out the false narratives of which we are all uh, accustomed to hearing. It's not that we hate Eugene Debs or, or the AFL, CIO. It's just that they weren't necessarily the first. Yep. And, and, I mean, it's important to understand that. We need to give credit where credit is due, yeah. like you said, starting on the plantations and starting with the Lowell Mill girls. Yeah. In fact... February of 1834, the board of directors requested that the women take a 15% wage reduction, citing an economic recession as the reason why they deserve to make 15% less than they uh, had actually, well, I, I wouldn't even say deserve, but what they were paid before. Mm -hmm. They deserve much more than all of that. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, we already heard about the dividends that they were making every year. That wasn't 14% like over those years. That was a 14% growth every year. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anyway. The workers end up meeting, organizing, and create what is called at that time a turnout. A turnout is just that era's term for like a strike. They're going to mm. go on strike. They're not going to work. Why is a strike important in labor history? I mean, it's the... No matter how much exploitation and oppression is taking place, it usually is the one action that the workers can have that gives them power. They can stop the work. Absolutely. And that's how you bring, I hit them in the wallet. That's how you yep, bring the oppressor exactly. to their knees in, in, in a capitalist system, oftentimes. Okay, so the other thing that they also did is not just go on strike, but they also seem to know how the banking system work. They immediately withdrew all of their savings, causing what is called a run on two local banks. And those banks suffered, which is fine. Like, poor banks. Who cares? Um, but it's important that they understood this. Now, another well, I don't, And I don't know if this is true for Lowell specifically, but most of the time, the banks were also owned by the company. So it would have been like the, I don't know if this is true, like I said, but the Lowell Bank where they would have been forced to keep their savings. So it obviously hits the company yep. more than just like the strike does or that a bank would. That's a good know? question that I don't know that we can answer in this episode. I yeah. do not know if those two banks were owned or in, 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 affiliated directly with, with the uh, factory. I'm willing to bet that there's direct affiliation because they're all in the same town, but regardless. Okay. As far as poetic mantra, these, this was like the idea uh, of this first strike in 1834. Uh, Let oppression shrug her shoulders, and a haughty tyrant frowned, and little upstart ignorance. In mockery look down, yet I value not the feeble threats of Tories in disguise, while the flag of independence, or our noble nation, flies. I love that poem because just like we've seen over and over again in U.S. history, they're taking the narrative, the celebrated ethically constitutive narrative of equality and liberty and freedom and everything that the United States says it stands for and showing, nope, doesn't stand for those things. It's not equitably, equitably distributed. And you all are hypocrites. Yeah. I love it. As I say, weird. More, more, more hypocrisy. hypocrisy. Weird. Strange. Weird. Weird. Um, okay. Anyway. Now, the bad news for this first strike in 1834 is it fails in a mere days. Many of the women um, felt pressured to go right back to work or leave town. And when I say pressured, um, there aren't a lot of clear sources on how that pressure was applied, why they ended up back at work, or why they were actually forced to leave the town altogether. But I'm willing to bet that it was usually male, and it was usually like violent or threatening. What do mm -hmm. you think? No, yeah, obviously. I'm sure they were getting death threats and 
etc. Anyone who knows about the later labor movements, of which we just kind of tried to discredit them a little bit, not really discredit them, just saying they weren't the start, that's usually what happened with those labor movements, is like public, or the, these corporations would hire... I don't know what the term is. Not, not militias. What would they? What would we call these people? Private Intimidators? security. Yeah. yeah. To basically pressure these workers to either get out of town or get back to work and mm -hmm. pressure violently. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, but this first strike ends up being a foundational piece, even though it kind of fails in only a couple of days. The powers that be in Lowell, Massachusetts, feel threatened, and they unleash a mass propaganda campaign denigrating any sort of organization like this. They asserted that organizing in this manner is, and I quote, unbecoming of women. What do you think of that? It's ridiculous. It's hilarious. Yeah. William Austin of the Lawrence Manufacturing Company had this to say, that disinterested advice, which has been on all proper occasions communicated to the girls of the Lawrence Mills, a spirit of evil omen has prevailed and overcome the judgment and discretion of too many. So yes, like that that's what we see here is this is the this is the narrative being like represented that these women are being basically misguided and being taken from like who they're supposed to be. Um and it is like there's also like a little bit of a religion here, the spirit and the omen and like you know, cuz obviously church service and all of these types of things yeah. is socialized into the system. Anyway, what we have um here is again another wonderful primary source on the topic uh harriet hansen robinson uh basically worked at lowell and lived through both of the strikes and this experience um and she wrote way later on like after she had had time to reflect i think in the 1890s at some point in her memoirs she wrote about her life in lowell massachusetts so rather than me explain it i'm just going to have her explain what life was like a in the mills and then b what life was like uh during the strike and how at least in her own words she kind of led one. At the time the Lowell Cotton Mills were started, the factory girl was lowest among women. In England and France particularly, great injustice had been done to her real character. She was represented as subjected to influences that could not fail to destroy her purity and self-respect. In the eyes of her overseer, she was but a brute slave to be beaten, pinched, and pushed about. It was to overcome this prejudice that such high wages had been offered to women that they might be induced to become mill girls, in spite of this opprobrium that still clung on to the degrading occupation. At first, only a few came, for though tempted by the high wages to be regularly paid in cash, there were many who preferred to be working some more genteel employment at 75 cents a week and their board. But in short time, the prejudice against factory labor wore away, and the lull mills became filled with blooming and energetic New England women. They were naturally intelligent, had mother wit, and fell easily into the ways of their new life, they soon began to associate with those who formed in the community in which they had come to live and were invited into their houses. They went to the same church and sometimes married into some of the best families. Or if they returned to their secluded homes again, instead of being looked down upon as factory girls by the squire's or lawyer's family, they were more often welcomed as coming from a metropolis, bringing new fashion, new books, and new ideas with them. One of the first strikes of cotton factory operatives that ever took place in this country was that in the Lowell in, eight, in October 1836. When it was announced that wages were to be cut down, great indignation was felt, and it was decided to strike en masse. This was done. The mills were shut down, and the girls went into procession from several corporations to the Grove on Chapel Hill and listened to incendiary speeches from early labor reformers. One of the girls stood on a pump and gave vent to the feelings of her companions in a neat speech declaring that it was their duty to resist all attempts at cutting down the wages. This was the first time a woman had spoken in public in Lowell, and the event had caused surprise and concern or cons consternation among her audience. My own recollection of this first strike, or turnout as it was called, is very vivid. I worked in the lower room, where I had heard of the proposed strike fully, if not vehemently, discussed. I had been an ardent listener to what was said against the attempt at oppression, on the part of the corporation, and I naturally took sides with the strikers. When the day came, which the girls were to turn out, those in the upper room started first, and so many of them left that our mill shut down. Then, when the girls in my room stood irresolute, uncertain what to do, asking each other, would you, or shall we turn out, and not one of them having the courage to lead off, I, who began to think they would not go out, after all of their talk, became impatient and started ahead, 
saying with childish bravado, I don't care what you do, I'm going to go out, whatever anyone else does or not. And I marched out and was followed by the others. Okay, so the workers, um, after we hear from Harriet Hanson Robinson, after these strikes, these workers form the Factory Girls Association and organize this turnout. Um, and like I said, Harriet Hanson Robinson talks about like how that kind of, that, that started. Um, to add a little bit more to what she had to say in my, my own voice, unfortunately, in this case, one of the girls stood on a, a, a pump and gave vent to the feelings of her companions in a, in a neat speech, declaring that it was their duty to resist all attempts uh, at cutting down the wages. This was the first time a woman had spoken in public in Lowell, and the event caused surprise and consternation among her audience. Again, I'm merely repeating what was already said in the excerpt we just heard, but I felt like it needed to be heard again. This is a first. Harriet Hanson Robinson is giving us the story of a first, probably not just in Massachusetts, but perhaps in the entire United States. A, not just, of course, of labor reform, but literally of women taking political or economic agency publicly. What do you think of that? That's so, so, so important. Um, I mean, this, this is why we chose to really talk about this, is it's super important in the history of the women's struggle for equality. Right. It's super important in the history of labor and labor organization and the workers' struggle for recognition also. Yeah. In terms of poetic mantra, we have another poem that is kind of like chanted during this time period. Um, it comes from a, a publication called Liberty, Liberty Rhetoric and the 19th Century Women, which is a great, great source to look at some of this liberty rhetoric. Anyway, Oh, isn't it a pity such a pretty girl as I should be sent to the factory to pine away and die. Oh, I cannot be a slave. I will not be a slave for I am fond of liberty that I cannot be a slave. Um, and again, these are the types of chants that you would hear during this time period. Enchanting and poetic mantra obviously is not unique to the 1840s or whatever. We still hear it in protest to this day. But what is the role of poetic mantra in any sort of movement? It doesn't matter if it's a, a, a labor movement or a, a protest in the streets. What do you think that the role of that is? I mean, it creates solidarity. It delivers a message in a very concise way. It, it gets people like a message to stand behind. This second strike of 1836 received much more popular support than the first one in 1834. It lasted for weeks. During the strike, though, the company then hiked rent. So here's the thing. When you, when you work for this company, either out of your, your, your wages or you pay them, you're charged rent to live in the boarding houses, right? So they raised the rent of these boarding houses and broke the contracts that they forced these women to sign. So the company broke the contracts because in that contract, it shows the terms of, of essentially what you would be paid and what you paid for your, your room and board. Like that, and when you change that in the middle of a contract, who's breaking the terms? Right, the company. The company. They don't have to play by the same rules as these women. Let's just make sure this is clear right now so that our listeners are following along. They're required as part of the contract to live in the company-provided boarding houses, yet they have to pay rent to live in those houses to the company. Right. Just so that's clear. 1,500 workers stopped work in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1836. So this is a much bigger turnout than the first one. Yeah, that's huge. Unfortunately, in terms of like long lasting legacy, it merely sets the ideas forward because this is what tends to happen with a lot of movements. And this is something that if those of you that are listening are endangering, are in excuse me, those of you that are listening, they need a little advisement here. One of the things that power across all time and space has been able to use are other outside events to challenge the sanctity or validity of your protest movement. And in this case, with Lowell, Massachusetts, it's a great example. A panic, and it really did happen. The Panic of 1837 did take place in the United States. It's an economic panic. A lot of banks called in, of course, their debts led to an economic recession. But that panic was then used as an excuse to guilt these women back into their roles. Why? I mean, power has been using, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be, I mean, most recently, like, oh my God, like, you know, here's, here's this pandemic. So you shouldn't be out doing what you're supposed to be doing or whatever. Like power over throughout time mm -hmm. has always been able to use events well outside its scope yeah. to basically force its way to end protests or strikes. And I mean, let's be clear. We're not saying that they like manufactured the crisis here in this case, though that in other times in history is the case. They were just op it was opportunists. It's happened to occur at this time when the strikes were taking place, when they were gaining steam. So they used this as a tool to convince the women to go back to work. 
Yeah, and sometimes it's used for even more insidious purposes, like to call for a war. Like exactly. we about, like the like events will be either manufactured or overtly uh, 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 pumped up to bigger than they are to be like, hey, we need to do this thing, um, whatever it might be, the sinking of the Lusitania or the Zimmerman telegram or the Thornton affair or the Gulf of Tonkin incident or whatever. You're not gonna throw nine eleven in there. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. This sets the stage for the first female union in the United States. So even though the strike eventually is broken because of the panic of 1837, the first female union is created in the United States. It is called the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association, and it is formed in 1845, and it grew fast. Its first action as a union was to position, petition, petition the Massachusetts General Court demanding a 10-hour workday. The committee was chaired, the committee that met this petition, not, not the women, but the adversary in this case, or the, the general court chair, was a man named William uh, Schooler, Schuler. Um, and he looked into the conditions, did an investigation, their demands, the treatment, and performed what are the first labor investigations by a government body in U.S. history. But let's not make this man a hero. He determined that the state... It is not the state's duty to control hours of work. What do you think of that? I mean, the, yeah. This becomes a hallmark goal of the labor movement that we now know gets... But what about this sentiment that it's not the state's goal to impose these sanctions upon, like, these private enterprises? And, mm -hmm. and, and of course, the, 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 the far right, whatever, would argue, or the true believers in the economic, like, all, all, or whatever, rising tides raise all boats and all that other nonsense... Like, they would argue the same thing. Yeah, like, free market. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, well, this is what happens. Yeah, Labor exactly. exploitation. So these these are believers in the exploitation of these young women. Mm -hmm. And that 73 hours of work, uh, of work is not too much. Right. I would ask them the same thing of, of today. Like, like, how is this a thing? Mm -hmm. They did found, during this time, this union found, the publication I've cited a couple of times, Voices of Industry, um, after buying a printing press, so they went out of their way, this is agency, bought a printing press, and under the tutelage of the very famed first wave feminist named Angelique Martin, um, created this publication to basically spread the word, not just of like first wave feminism, but of women and labor. These women are active participants in the ever evolving and progressing progressive notion of labor rights in the united states and we have proof of it in voices of industry now that's dope that they went out and bought a printing press themselves so that they could create material to support their cause like that's awesome especially back then like nowadays whatever anyone can make a zine you can start a blog tomorrow like yeah. or a podcast like we did but back then in order to have a voice in publication there were much higher Oh, yeah. like barriers to entry so the fact that they actually went out and acquired a printing press on their own and started pumping out this stuff that's awesome the publication got popular enough to where they eventually did receive like a a, a from the company not the state a 30 minute reduction in their day their work day i don't know if you have any thoughts on that that's i mean i, I want to say like that's ridiculous but on the other hand i want to say like it worked they didn't get what they wanted but we see here an example of the company bending to their demands, at least, at least some. some. It like, does spill over to the next state, however. Even though it didn't happen in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire passed a law during this time for a 10-hour workday. Mm -hmm. So while Massachusetts wasn't ready to step up to the yeah. plate yet, New Hampshire, watching what was going by in its neighboring state... Just so our listeners are make clear here, right? Like, they're fighting for a 10-hour workday. That's what they're fighting for. Yeah. Um... Their inspiration, co-founder, and president of this union must not go unmentioned because one of the things we do here in Myth is America is teach people about real American heroes, not necessarily uh, the people that have been propped up unjustly or unethically. And one of those is a woman named Sarah Bagley. Um, alongside being the leader of the union um, and the president, uh, she went on to uh, have an amazing career in what we would just now call activism. She was just an activist for her era. Sarah Bagley went on to lead a peace movement against the Mexican-American War, of which we have a future episode coming up, which will completely blow Texas history out of the water. Um, that, that whole obfuscation of any type of fact that they teach down there. Uh, but regardless... Um, We're going to lose every Texan listener that we have. I, do, do we care? No. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, back to the story here. 
But she would go on to be a major leader in the peace movement against the Mexican-American War, which when we get to, we'll find out, was a wildly unjust war. I mean, so unjust that like even Abraham Lincoln was like, you, you can't do this. He was not president yet, but yeah. Um, she organized speeches against the propertyless voting restrictions that were, took, were, that, that took, were in each and every state. Um, and she was a major advocate for first wave feminism, which of course most of our listeners are aware was for women's suffrage, women's right to vote and be equal in the political sphere. So Sarah Bagley deserves like massive shout out here for being one of these like wildly important American heroes during this period of time. In 1840, there's also another con concession where we're getting a lot of this information from. And again, you can actually Google it. It is available in PDF form in numerous ways. You don't have to pay for it. It's called the Lowell Offering. This was a, a, a publication basically produced by the women that worked at the factory. And not all of them were radical. Some of them in this offering wrote about how they liked it there. But regardless, it's the best place for a primary sources on what life was like to live in these factories for these women. And they wrote their own articles. And those articles would be published um, every year in the Lowell Offering. And so it's a wonderful primary source. A couple of interesting like articles you can find in there would be like Women's Proper Sphere, which was an article that questioned equity uh, roles in society. And honestly, it's not super radical because after a question questioning it, it concluded um, that it was up to women to impose their own self limits on how they engage in society. So that was we would consider that a little bit more conservative article. But regardless, it's there. So if you want to get like a good variety of sources rather than Nick and I's uh, more radical ones, the low offering is a, is a great place to look. Um, Recollections of an Old Maid uh, talks about more or less, it kind of like defends uh, living as a marriageless factory girl, like, and not conforming to society standards of what you're supposed to be as a woman. It doesn't necessarily defame the factory at all. It actually kind of says like, I'm going to factory girl and I work and I don't need a dude. Like, like that's what it, that's, that's what the article did, uh, says. There are more poignant critiques about what life was like in Lowell as well, like the very famous uh, peep at factory life, which reads a little bit like the one we uh, heard from earlier. But anyway, the Lowell offering, I cannot recommend that anymore as a place to find great primary sources on what it was like to be a woman in Massachusetts uh, in the 19th century. Okay, as far as like what was going on in Lowell as time like progresses after these strikes, well, things start to be put on hold in terms of labor progress for women. And things that put uh, this progress on hold are some major events. The first is mass immigration coming uh, heavily from, like, Ireland. Uh, this is around the time, and our Irish listeners, or Irish heritage listeners, I should say. I don't think anyone in Ireland listens to this. But Irish heritage listeners, so we always have a couple in class that are super, like, passionate. Um, this, is, this is when mass migration began um, from Ireland. And I must stress this. When many of those uh, Irish did not also get to live the American dream because they were also treated horrifically as immigrants, as Catholic. They were treated awfully here. Not as awfully as by the British, but still awfully. Um, many of them found their way into the factories. And slowly but surely, factory work looked more for Irish immigrants or other immigrants, like Eastern, Euro Eastern European immigrants, Italian immigrants, etc., rather than women. In fact, actually, why, Nick, did they stop employing American women and look more for immigrants to fill those factory systems? The, it created a different narrative other than like you can be independent from a man or at least you can generate demonstrate some independence to prove yourself worthy of a husband this was a labor force that they could control much easier that hadn't they didn't have to deal with the fact that they were assimilated into american society etc they had frankly lower expectations and so they could control them and exploit them at even greater levels Absolutely. Um, and then here's the other major event that kind of like makes this whole women suffrage and labor movement put on a back burner. It's a pretty big event, even though I find it boring as hell. It's the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, 1861 to 1865. And before you get offended that I said it was boring as hell, it's not that it's not important. I'm not saying that. It's just oversaturated in American historiography. So I'm not saying it's not important. It's just everybody has said everything there is to say about the Civil War at this point. So I, I guess as a historian, I'm just kind of taught. I'm Yeah. I've got civil war mm -hmm. fatigue. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so it is important. Um, and that's one of the things that kind of puts this labor movement on on its uh, uh, on the back burner. 
uh, when I was doing research for this, I'll look at all kinds of resources. I'll look at like obviously my historical annals and historical resources and texts and blah 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 and primary sources. That's my job. But I'll also look at popular sources. Um, and honestly, a popular source taught me something new about Lowell, so I feel like I need to get give it uh, some just do. Just do again. Wikipedia is that popular source in this case. And again, it's not. I'm not saying go there for like historical accuracy. I'm just saying it's good to check all your sources. Um, and I wasn't aware of this, but Noam Chomsky himself, and the only reason I know this is it comes from the, that, the, the entry on Lowell in Wikipedia, um, Noam Chomsky himself wrote about Lowell, and he made uh, some important connections that I do think we deserve to talk about. Um, again, w Wikipedia is not the end-all be-all of knowledge, and I do highly encourage you not to use that as your only source, or, or if you want real accuracy, maybe a source at all. But it does introduce interesting ideas, and this is a new idea, so let's hear from Noam Chomsky on this. When you sell your product, you retain your person. But when you sell your labor, you sell yourself losing the rights of free men and becoming vassals of mammoth establishments, of a moneyed aristocracy that threatens annihilation to anyone who questions their right to enslave and oppress. Those who work in the mills ought to own them, not to have the status of machines ruled by private despots who are entrenching monarchic principles on democratic soil as if they drive downwards freedom and rights, civilization, health, morals, and intellectuality in the new commercial feudalism. Now, in Chomsky's words, that's what he says he read from one of the Lowell Mill sources. So again, this, is, this, this, this source has gone through multiple filters, but regardless, I want Nick, as our sociologist, and who's read more Chomsky than me, to kind of analyze that. We talk about this all the time, actually, about how we promote democracy in this country to such, I mean, it's like nauseating, but the vast majority of our life, meaning our work life, is a complete totalitarian dictatorship. Okay. We don't get to vote on how many hours a day we work or what products we're going to manufacture or what the policies of our companies are going to be. And like, that's just not a thing. We've all just accepted the fact that we work somewhere and we basically adhere to the policies and the activities of that corporation. And somehow we think that, well, we have the freedom that if we disagree, we can go work somewhere else. And somehow we've accepted that minute level of freedom. We don't have, there is not democracy in the workplace. That doesn't exist. But somehow we've accepted in America that as long as we have some democracy in the political system, which we don't even have, but that's a whole other conversation, we're willing to accept this like totalitarian rule over the entire rest of our lives. And it's just, it's ridiculous, frankly. And I don't know why it's not talked about enough and put in those terms. Yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely understand what you're saying there. Like that's, that's why I like that quote. And that's like I said, why I usually won't necessarily cite like those types of sources. I like the more like whatever historically reputable sources. But in this one, when I found this, I thought it was actually a really great quote. So we're trusting like, again, multiple lenses here, but I think it's wonderful. Thank you for breaking that down, Nick. Um, so did the Lowell Mill girls strikes like work work as far as we're concerned? Yes, there was some reduction in, 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 in work day. Uh, yes, eventually they found themselves outside of the factory with a little bit more freedom. But most importantly, the legacy here is what we always like to talk about in Myth is America. Um, what is the legacy here of these little mill girls, in your opinion, in terms of labor? Um, or even in terms of, like, women's roles in society? What are your mm -hmm. thoughts after kind of, like, running through that? This is one of those things that I think is a landmark event that most people probably have never heard of. I don't even know if it's taught at all in, like, K-12 through history i can't even remember i don't remember learning about it but that doesn't mean that it wasn't taught um but yeah as far as women's rights struggle and the struggle for workers rights the lowell mill girls and their actions is like the landmark i mean it's it's the beginning of many of this and like you said even though it wasn't fully effective they didn't get the reduction to the working hours that they wanted etc the fact that they were willing to do this and at such a scale, right? Like you could say like, oh, two people of this factory stopped working or whatever, but there are 1,500 women here. Right. That's huge. And they did have an impact in neighboring New Hampshire that yep. put in the 10-hour uh, workday and et cetera. So like you said, even though it sort of loses steam with Irish immigration and the Civil War and so on, we can't gloss over the importance of this in history well and they start a conversation so yep. many people especially in today's like more fast-paced even more mechanized society than they exist than they existed in we are an immediate gratification we're expecting like to see results like right away mm -hmm. and have those results to be accessible or measurable or whatever bullshit catchword we use in our corporations or systems of education like those are the things that we're about now like we, i have to see it proven on with data or actual like facts or narratives or whatever like but in this case 
merely starting the conversation. See, that's what happens oftentimes with revolutionary processes or social movement processes is those that begin the process, unfortunately, don't always get to be the ones to see the end of the process. And we have to be okay with that. And that's not just advisement regarding Lowell Mill girls. That's, that's advisement regarding anybody that is seeking some sort of social change or progress today is you have to be okay that the measurable, observable results might not be yours to own. And we need to understand that history oftentimes glorifies, over glorifies, and over emphasizes the results, and very often de emphasizes the people that were brave enough to begin the conversation in the first place. And that's what the Lowell Mill girls did, both for women and for labor, was to begin that conversation and were willing to put themselves on the line, frankly, I'm sure their lives on the line many times to start that conversation. Take us home, sir. All right. Find us online, revolutionandideology.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube if you're not already watching this on YouTube. Just search Revolution and Ideology. We'll show up there. Subscribe uh, wherever you listen to your podcasts if you want just the audio version of this. If you like what we're doing, uh, suggest us to your friends. Leave us a rating and a review in your podcast app. Uh, And if you really, really like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon. It helps us to invest more time to put out high quality content. Also on this one, I'm gonna look at my phone here to make sure I get this right, uh, because this is just a little dabble into sort of like labor history, but I want to give a huge shout out to a podcast. It's called Working Class History, and they're literally their entire podcast, and this has been going on for a while now, it's really, really high quality, is just the history of workers throughout the world. Like I'm looking here, uh, episodes 30 and 31 are the Hong Kong riots of 1967. Um, They have an episode on like lesbian and gays supporting minors and their strikes. And like, I mean, it's the gamut all the way back to like, I know they have one on the Lowell girls and uh, I mean, the history of labor in the world. And it is incredibly, incredibly good. So check them out. That's Working Class History uh, podcast. Yeah, I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.